Hi, I'm Bill Crystal. Welcome back to Conversations. I'm pleased to be joined today by two of Washington's best reporters, uh, Jonathan Martin and Alex Burns from the New York Times, who have been doing excellent reporting for the Times and before that for Politico for years, but now have co-authored an important book, uh, This Will Not Pass, which we will refer to, I'm sure, in the course of this discussion. I will say a word about both Jonathan and Alex, who I've known over the years. I mean, they're excellent reporters. Uh, dig up uh, things from many, many sources and uh, look into travel the country, but also much, I will say this, much more analytical and much more knowledge of history, maybe than your typical uh, reporter. And so rare combination of, of sort of uh, shoe leather and uh, uh, historical perspective and analysis. So it's really a pleasure to have you both on to explain our current political situation. Thanks. Thank you, Bill. And what the date, just so people know, since God knows what will happen, to, you know, tonight, to totally change everything in the world uh, is what are we? What are we? May, uh, May 17th, I think. So, yeah. um, so mid-May, a uh, year and a half, well, less than a little year and a little less than a half, I guess, into the Biden presidency. Your book focuses on Trump and Biden in 2020 and 2021. Uh, the, a lot of the Trump and Republican side of it has gotten a lot of publicity, Kevin McCarthy and so forth. But actually, I thought maybe we'd begin with Biden because... Sure. It's so astonishing. He's a new president. He's replaced a president of another party. There's usually a massive amount of coverage of a new president, a new White House. What are they doing? What are their what are their successes and failures? There's been some of that, but it's really striking. And I was struck by this reading your book in a way. The Trump stuff was excellent, but it was a lot of people have tried to cover that ground. It's, I've never been in, in the years I've been in Washington. I don't know if you guys agree with this. The the, the, there's so much less coverage, understandably, I think, but of, of the actual president of the United States and his party who are governing the country. Right. It's kind of astonishing. It's remarkable, Bill. And I, I'm half tempted to begin this discussion talking about the Moynihan Abzug primary, given that plug that you were kind <laughs> enough to offer us uh, and how everything flows from there in today's Democratic Party. But I'm going to resist that. That's, we'll do that in another conversation, Jonathan. That could be uh, that could that be, be a, that will have a very niche audience. But it could be our three. It's a great niche, though. Yeah, it's a great niche. <laughs> Bill, it, it's astonishing. There's no other way to put it. Um, the lack of attention and coverage um, that this White House gets. Um, historically, the presidency, the White House, is a coveted beat in American journalism. It is the sort of prestige beat in Washington journalism. Um, but for a lot of reasons, it's been striking to, to see uh, just how little stories are coming out of this White House. And I'll tell you, just from our experience doing this book, uh, This Will Not Pass, it's not like there's any lack of rivalries or tensions or uh, really compelling storylines in the Biden White House and in Biden's Washington. Oh, my goodness. I mean, we, we uncovered um, a number of fascinating uh, moments, anecdotes and really, I think, riveting um, uh, history uh, from 2021 as Biden tried to govern this divided country, in his own fractious party. And uh, it's it's puzzling that there's not more of it day in, day out. And I, I can defer to Alex on perhaps the why. But look, I clearly part of it is the ongoing Trump story. Um, but I think part of it also owes to there's just frankly less interest among, I think, editors, frankly, uh, Bill. It's just it's not as big of a story as Trump. And uh, the sort of players aren't as compelling, perhaps. And the leaks don't come as easily. But I'll. I mean, I'd say, I mean, Biden's a normal president and Trump is leading at this point an abnormal opposition party. And it's therefore understandable that people on some level, want to, yes. want to on some level want to focus on the opposition party. And there's a lot hinges on it, God knows. But well, so, Alex, I mean, what you guys did a lot of reporting, you talked to everyone from I can't remember if you talked to the president himself or maybe you, you, you won't say you can't say, but you certainly talked to every senior person around him and then to a lot of senior Democrats on the Hill and out and around the country. And I want to get to some of the sort of lesser well-known ones as well in terms of thinking about the future of the Democratic Party, which is kind of also important, you know, not just the Republican Party. But right. what, what what will our viewers who are you know paying some attention, but what would they learn? What, what, what should they know about Biden himself as president and about the Biden White House? That's sort of not not quite obvious. Gosh, I mean, it's hard, it's hard to know where to start. Um, you know, I, I, I agree with everything that you and Jonathan said about just the paucity of really a deep uh, uh, sort of penetrating coverage of what, you know, how this administration really works uh, and, you know, why in so many uh, instances it doesn't seem to be working that well. 
Um, I think that, you know, part of what, what the, one of the advantages that I think that we had uh, in our reporting was you know, not being bound by the strictures of a really traditionally defined uh, sort of turf role, right? That we're not just telling the story of Biden. We're not just telling the story uh, of congressional Democrats or the midterm campaign where and we're kind of able to you know, drive all over the road here. And it actually helps a lot, um, particularly when the president you're uh, talking about is Joe Biden. Uh, Look, I think one of the central tensions of this book is Biden's indecisiveness about what kind of president he really wants to be. Does he want to be somebody who brings the country together? Does he want to be somebody who uh, sort of goes big and transforms uh, the country from top to bottom, uh, like FDR uh, or LBJ? Uh, and Bill, hanging over that question, uh, is his age and the reality that uh, it's it's you know as we're speaking today, and certainly as we were reporting the book, uh, it it you know one of the biggest open questions in Washington is is he even going to run? Uh, for a second term. It's been a very, very long time uh, since that was a reasonable question to ask about an incumbent president of the United States. And so uh, his sort of grasping for uh, sort of greatness in the eyes of history and the impatience of his own party to get everything they can out of this guy uh, while the getting is still good, uh, and also the, uh, the impatience of you know, the next generation of Democrats, uh, and frankly, not even particularly uh, 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 the vice president, which is who you would expect uh, that story to focus on, but governors, senators, members of the House, uh, members of his own administration who are, you know, a young or maybe middle aged men and women in kind of a hurry. Right. Um, so to me, I think the churn within the Democratic Party uh, that is being just barely suppressed uh, by this president who's about to be 80, by a speaker of the House who is uh, who is already past 80. Uh, you know, to me, that is one of the big ongoing uh, stories of that party in our time. I and mean, I, I guess I would have said Bill, well, the countervailing ahead, force of people like you in the bulwark who voted for Joe Biden, not because you wanted the New Deal sequel, but because you wanted uh, to borrow from a earlier 20th century president, a return to normalcy. Uh, you wanted a sort of a. Uh, you know, restrained um, uh, a president who was not going to do tweets in the middle of the night, somebody who was going to return to sort of the traditional norms of the American presidency at home and abroad, uh, center, center left, okay, but basically somebody who was going to sort of have a steady hand at, at the tiller uh, after a really tumultuous moment. And, you know, as you know, Abigail Spanberger famously said after the results in Virginia last year, um, where Democrats lost the governor's campaign, uh, people didn't elect him to be FDR. They they wanted this return to normalcy. Uh, so there's so that what happened? I mean, I, let's too. let's go through that a bit and, because I totally. I mean, Biden's self advertised and I think honest running reason for running was Charlottesville and the being appalled that an American president could behave that way. It wasn't that he thought he was uniquely able to pass the biggest health care plan or the biggest, uh, you know, Green New Deal or whatever that could be passed. Um, I'm sure he has a decent opinion of his own abilities. But so what I mean, I want what happened? I know why in the little I know the people around him reasonably well. I wouldn't have said that a heck of a lot of them were really in the let's just transform America with 50 senators and 220 right. House members. But do you I mean, how much of a difference do you think that has made? How much has that put them off course? How much has that made the governing strategy somewhat incoherent? Is that or is that just kind of noise and underneath it, they kind of it's been pretty steady. What do you think, Jonathan and then Alex? I think as we capture in the book, Biden was the rare major party nominee who essentially outlined his platform um, after he became the nominee right. and really embraced a more progressive platform. Um, it's sort of the reverse Nixon, where you sort of run to the flank in the primary and then to the middle and the general Biden kind of did the opposite of that. But it was during COVID and obviously uh, Trump's aberrance sort of capturing headlines every day. So it wasn't fully uh, noticed, but it was sure as heck noticed by the progressives who helped write that platform. And so I think the bill came due after Biden was sworn in. The progressives said, you have this platform in black and white that we helped write. We expect you to pursue it. We now have a majority in both chambers, thanks to the Georgia runoff. Let's use this moment of crisis to go big. Yeah, on the other hand, you had a lot of voters who voted for Joe Biden for one reason. He was not Donald Trump. And I think there was always that tension that is hanging over Biden. And I think he decided in the first months of year one to go with the progressives and try to sort of get the biggest legacy he could uh, in his first year. So you think that was really a 
pretty self-conscious decision by him. I do. Yeah. And Bill, I really think that they got uh, emboldened after they passed the ARP. They, they, they convinced Manchin to stay on board, passed a sweeping uh, rescue plan in March of 21. And shortly after, we have the scene in the book where there's the historians uh, coming to the White House and the historians, Kearns Goodwin and Michael Beschloss, Walter Isaacson, and a handful of them are encouraging the FDR comparison, saying, you, you, know, you know, you can go big, seize this moment of crisis and sort of be a transformational president. And Bill, there's, there's one more thing that, that we ought to mention, which is also in the book, and that is, in the back of Biden's mind is this sibling rivalry that he has with Barack Obama. And, you know, Biden has never gotten over the shabby treatment he believes that he received in the Biden, I'm sorry, in the, in the Obama White House, rather. And here in the spring of 21, Biden is thinking to himself, this is my chance to be an even bigger president on policy than the crowd that never really took me seriously, the Obama crowd. Yeah. And I think that, that that really counts with Biden. I think he, he craves that respect. He craves that sort of historic significance. And I think that's at work here as Biden tries to go big in 21. Bill, the two things I would add to that uh, uh, is that there are two sort of external forces that I think sort of make it easier for Biden, you know, personally and for his administration uh, to shift in that direction. One is uh, COVID, right? That after he becomes, him locking up the nomination basically coincides uh, with uh, the coronavirus striking uh, the U.S. And suddenly, you know, it's not just that he moves left in the general election to consolidate support in the party, although that's definitely part of it. It's also that the economy is like a smoking heap of ash and the idea that your uh, policy platform is going to be, well, we're going to uh, somewhat broaden the open enrollment process for the ACA <laughs> is just so clearly uh, inadequate to the moment, yeah. right? So I think it's an, a big invitation um, uh, and big temptation uh, to go really big in some respect or another. Now, Biden is is not now and has never been a big ideas guy. So he looks around for like who's got them. And it's mostly uh, at that point, uh, the left or people at least who are significantly to um, uh, the sort of mode in which he campaigned uh, mm -hmm. significant, significantly to the left of the Joe Biden we saw uh, in the primary um, but, you know, in that moment, we have a scene in the book where uh, on the even Michigan primary, he's riding around uh, in a car with Cory Booker, who's encouraging him. You know, the way you should think about getting stuff done as president is basically only to pursue things that are overwhelmingly popular. Like, don't choose 55, 45 issues, choose 80, 20 issues. Biden seems to find that very compelling. It's obviously not what he uh, ultimately does as president. And real quick, the other uh, forces, uh, January 6th, that. You know, if COVID closes off the sort of or seems to close off the go small on policy uh, approach or go really incremental uh, on policy approach in the winter and spring of 2021, there is just enormous skepticism in Biden's party after January 6th that reaching across the aisle is a worthwhile exercise in any way that, you know, yes, you've still got your Susan Collinses and Lisa Murkowski's, although there's a lot of uh, skepticism about them, too. But the idea, you know, for so many Democrats, the idea of, of working with Republicans just becomes anathema, you know, on its own. Uh, and that, too, I think sort of constrains Biden's options and nudges him uh, in one direction. Yeah, interesting. I mean, of course, FDR, I mean, there was an economic crash, obviously, because of COVID. It's nothing like what FDR faced, honestly. And FDR went big, but he went big sort of incrementally, if, if not right. to get to, into the weeds too much. But, you know, Social Security doesn't get passed in 33, right? He, he deals right. with the immediate problems they have, relief, banks and relief. And you could argue that that's kind of like what Biden did with the rescue plan. Maybe it could have it was a little too big, probably. But then to kind of let the whole party get tangled up in the Build Back Better drama seems like a little bit of a, I don't know, that that is a little mystifying to me, leaving aside even what one thinks of it. I I mean, you'd think January 6th might cut the other way, which is might be hard to reach out to Republicans once they rally back to Trump uh, after, during the impeachment and all that. But on the other hand, it sort of would strengthen the case, I should think, for you know, a certain kind of let's make sure democratic norms are reestablished here. And and then if the Republicans aren't willing to go with it, you sort of really have them on the hook, I should think, in a way that having endless debates about five hundred billion versus three hundred billion dollars of this or that doesn't quite clarify what's at stake. Well, I and mean, the other thing is, go the, ahead. Yeah. The, their experience with Manchin, with the ARP, it 
it's not fair to call it near death, but there was a Friday afternoon evening that was really hairy that I think that the sort of junkies out there will recall where Manchin almost torpedoed the ARP because he wanted to vote for some uh, amendment that would have effectively been a poison bill, right? This sort of lost in the midst of history, but it should have had resonance. And I think the Biden people did not sort of take that as a warning sign. Uh, after that, they should have realized Manchin's going to be a problem. We barely got him on ARP. We had to sort of get, get Biden out of the bullpen at the last minute to save ARP with Manchin. Maybe we should sort of take the best possible deal Manchin will offer. And we know what that was because Manchin, Bill, put it on paper and gave it to Chuck Schumer. Um we know what Manchin was going to be for. And I, I, it is puzzling that they would not have just that summer of 21 sort of embraced what they could get from Manchin and obviously from, from cinema and sort of passed the BBB and uh, and called it at least a day and claimed victory in some level. But Alex raises an important point, too, which is like the Democratic Party wants something more than just what Joe Manchin is willing to cut. And I think especially in the House, Nancy Pelosi is seeing her own legacy here. And I think deferred to the White House, let, let them do the bipartisan transportation infrastructure bill, but really was sort of waiting for BBB. And I think she, she wanted to get a sort of bigger bill. And that certainly was where her caucus wanted to go. But that pursuit of a larger bill obviously would create real challenges because by the fall, as we know, Manchin was looking for any excuse to delay, to stall, to put it off. And then obviously by December, he uh, he puts uh, the, a sort of knife in it. Yeah, I mean, FDR had massive congressional majorities, which were increased by his own, his own in his own election, of course, in 32, began in 30 in the off year. I've always thought the fact, they didn't really internalize the facts, maybe, um, maybe well, I'll ask you, did they, that they lost seats in the House in 2020 and law, didn't do well at the state level and yeah. barely won the Senate in a very unusual circumstances in Georgia. And so won, won the Senate 50-50. And it seems like they just, there was a certain disconnect at some point of what it actually, what the voters had sort of signaled they wanted, I think, in 2020 and what they were, what they were trying to do. I, I mean, like Alex on this, but like, I think that Georgia was such a powerful moment for the yeah. Democratic Party that in some ways Georgia almost erased the memories yeah. of a disappointing election night in November. Alex, you want to jump? In? Yeah, no, I think that's that's clearly true. And, you know, you go from, you know, uh, on January 4th, uh, Joe Biden has 48 seats in the Senate and a paper thin House majority. And it looks like he's not going to get a thing done if he can even get his cabinet confirmed to you know night of January 5th. You suddenly have the Senate majority and the door has swung open. And then January 6th, uh, Trump seems to drive his uh, whole party uh, off a cliff in the insurrection. And so I think that's a hugely disorienting and obviously traumatic moment uh, for Washington. And I think for a lot of Democrats, it feels like, OK, you know, the the, the gates have swung wide open, even though uh, they didn't really uh, or at least not uh, open all that wide. Um, but look, I think that um, you know, you said the country had indicated what it wanted in November of 2020. I think it certainly indicated what it didn't want. Right. It didn't want Donald Trump. It didn't want this sort of offensive circus like uh, incompetent administration. But it also and, you know, we have reporting in the book of Nancy Pelosi and Chuck Schumer themselves saying this. Uh, it didn't want to defund the police. It didn't want sort of uh, contemptuousness of, of law enforcement and indifference towards a uh, violent crime. Uh, it didn't want, um, you know, Nancy Pelosi is uh, a reference in the book saying that the way that the Democratic Party talks about a uh, socialism uh, as a mainstream idea uh, and abortion uh, you know, is off putting to immigrant communities of different stripes, Asian Americans uh, and, and Latino communities uh, in the U.S. And so there is a period of time uh, in November when at least at the very uh, top tier of the Democratic establishment, I think there is a relatively clear eyed sense that our our people uh, uh, screwed us up on this one. Right. That we had we could have done a lot better uh, if our party had stayed closer to what has been in contemporary American politics, the sort of mainstream boundaries uh, of political debate. And, and we we really cost ourselves uh, opportunities as a result. But then all that uh, goes away. I think that, you know, the, the character of Chuck Schumer, I think, is particularly uh, important on this one where, you know, he has now in November of 2020, it looks like for the third consecutive cycle, uh, he has revved up his party to take back control of the Senate and fallen short, made 
clearly uh, uh, serious uh, missteps when it comes to candidate recruitment and strategy, gets clobbered in the state of Maine, which is a state that Biden carries. Uh, and Democrats in that period, Senate Democrats are kind of confronting him and saying, like, what on earth happened here? Like, how can how, did, how come this keeps on happening and what are we going to do differently? And then Georgia happens and then January 6th happens and is never uh, discussed in the same way again. I think January 5th is a very important reminder. You know, Carville said that to me a year ago, I think, on one of these conversations. The January 5th and January 6th together created a huge moment, but its dynamics, the way it worked out was both complicated, right? Both sort of a blessing and a, maybe a bit of a curse is too strong, but a problem for the Democrats. You've mentioned Schumer, Pelosi. Talk a little bit maybe about the Biden White House. I mean, I guess these people whom I've known a long time there, I should have thought would have been telling President Biden, you know, we need to kind of cut fish or cut bait here on some of these things. We need to find some things to run on that are actually winners and, and we can't bring up the same Voting Rights Act five times in the Senate, but maybe we could pass the Electoral Count Act and fix what even conservatives agree, <laughs> even a fair number <laughs> of Republicans agree is kind of a problematic system that led to January 6th. I do think when people come down from Mars and look at the country, what are we now? I just, uh, May 17th, 2022, we have this whole rickety system that we saw the how danger, how rickety it was, how weak the guardrails were, how insecure they were between November 3rd and January 6th, November 3rd, 2020, and January 6th, 2021, nothing has been done to fix it. I mean, I don't mean that in some rhetorical sense. I mean, literally, there's plenty of draft legislation floating it's around. Wildly. There are plenty of brilliant con law professors talking about, well, if you can't get everything, you can at least fix A, B, and C. D may be too complicated. Nothing. There's not even a bill introduced. But, but Bill, it's that, really that, astonishing, that, I think. No, that very attitude that you just described is what's been missing from basically every major legislative debate since the ARP. Right. Like who is willing to sit down with the major constituencies of the Democratic Party and say, I'm sorry, uh, we can't give you that. Like we're not able to do A, B and C, but we can do D. And so we're going to do D. Like there is just no moment when that happens on voting rights. It doesn't happen on the sort of big uh, a bucket of stuff that at one point or another, uh, is called a uh, build back better. Um, and so if the president is not willing to sit down with or the president or his chief of staff or his senior advisors are not willing to sit down uh, with the new Dems, uh, the new Dem caucus, the centrists in the House on one day uh, and the progressive caucus uh, in the House on the next day and tell them the same thing. Right. Which is like, these are the three or four things we think we can do and we need your support on it. Then that's how you end up in this endless months long quagmire where you end up with close to nothing. But where do we stand now, Jonathan? Why? I mean, do you think, you know, are they still in a quagmire? Do they, have they kind of gotten through this patch and see a clear path for the next six months, but also for the next two and a half years? I think it's difficult to suggest that they have. I mean, you mentioned effectively torpedoed the Build Back Better bill in mid-December and that Fox News Sunday interview. It's now mid-May. I don't see a theory of the case on policy or politics uh, for the duration of this year, with the exception of Biden's staff hoping that he'll take a more confrontational tone with Republicans and castigate them as the MAGA party, which obviously uh, is a way of sort of uh, raising doubts about their stewardship of government, tying them to Trump. So I guess there's that political strategy. It's a, I think it remains to be seen how willing Biden is to drive that message every day. But as for a policy plan, I mean, yeah, whether it's the ECA bill or the remnants of Build Back Better, it's not clear to me what the White House's approach is on salvaging either. Um, I just don't see uh, any progress. It's remarkable to me uh, the willingness the White House has to just let the Congress bring up these message bills that they, they know are going to be defeated, um, whether it's the voting bill or whether it's um, it's uh, abortion rights. Uh, it's it's. Um, it's striking to watch. Um, I do think about Bill, it goes to the heart of the Biden conundrum, which is Joe Biden's always wanted to be liked and he wanted to be liked by who he was with. And I think we, we see that when Biden's with sort of the moderate Democrats who suggest he suggests sort of he's one of them. Um, and I think uh, he's sort of comfortable in that crowd. But he's never sort of been an obvious sort of moderate Democrat. He was never a big DLC guy. He's always sort of been wherever the party was at the moment. And you also see sort of Biden's being very conscious of trying to stay hip to the political times. And by that, I mean, wanting to convey to younger, more progressive Democrats. Yes, I'm with you also on the issues, too. I've always been there. Alex and I have referenced in the book to this, you know, whenever 
a climate change comes up, Biden gets almost defensive about it. And he loves to claim that he wrote the first ever climate bill, the history of Congress. Um, the fact check on that is still uh, being performed. Um, but it's, it's classic Biden, though, which is, you know, he's not going to let anybody get to his left if somebody's challenging him in that moment from the left. But at the same time, if he's with a sort of moderate Democrat crowd, even Republicans, he wants to sort of be with them and sort of sort of channel their view in that moment, too. And to Alex's point about telling the same thing to the new Dems one day and CPC the next, that's awfully tough for this president. Yeah. I mean, I just feel like you think of the Reagan White House first term. I wasn't here then, but one reads about it, you know, Baker and Darman and all these characters uh, uh, told the president, work very hard, Stockman, to get the original tax cut through, which was Reagan's, you know, signature. Uh, they made a lot of compromises, incidentally, and got to get the votes they had to get. People forget how much it differed from the original proposal. And then in 82, Baker came to the press and said, look, we have to accept both for policy and really political reasons, a bit of a tax hike, take back a little bit of the tax cut. The, to have Fred, the right, some of your base is going to be unhappy with this, Mr. President. And he was like, OK, look, we got to do what we got to do to govern. I kind of feel like, is there a Jim Baker telling uh, Joe Biden what what Jim Baker told Ronald Reagan? And- well, we certainly don't have a character uh, uh, telling him that uh, in our book. And I think that part of the a challenge is that, you know, there is a, a, a split within the Biden inner circle within the White House staff as to you know whether you're more persuaded by the uh, run to the middle uh, or run to the left approach. You know, the, the two most, uh, I think, prominent and it's oversimplified, but uh, the, the sort of poles of that debate are, you know, Steve Reschetti, the uh, uh, you know longtime uh, operative and lobbyist and Biden, a uh, former chief of staff and the vice presidency uh, on one hand, and Ron Klain, uh, the former uh, chief of staff um, to, you know, multiple vice presidents, including uh, Biden and the current White House chief of staff uh, on the other, who is much more drawn to the uh, progressive caucus and sort of the the New Deal option here. Um, I think that there are people, you know, it's one of these debates where uh, uh, it's like one of my favorite kinds of political debate, a bill where like everybody is basically right about each other. Right. Where, uh, you know, it's not that like the people saying that Ron Klain is too close to the progressive caucus and too sort of taken in by uh, the Pramila Jayapals of the world. They're not wrong. Uh, And the people who say that, you know, Steve Reschetti is sort of too comfortable doing the Susan Collins and Rob Portman thing, not sensitive enough to uh, the uh, internal dynamics of his own party, particularly in the House. They're also right. Um, But what there isn't is uh, somebody in the middle of all this. And it could be a Jim Baker figure. It actually could be the president of the United States himself uh, who's willing to say, listen, guys, like I hear uh, the strategy on this side and this side, but like I, Joe Biden, want us to do this. Right. And I think that the the absurdity of this situation is just there's, it, it's not summed up uh, better anywhere other than the fact that like on the day it died, we still didn't really know what was going to be in Build Back Better. Right. That you have months of back and forth and this like ultimately uh, far too clever by half approach of, you know, let Bernie put out a six trillion dollar plan and then somebody else will put out a a one trillion dollar plan and we'll meet at three trillion dollars and then we'll decide what's going to be in it. Right. It's just a way of putting off. Uh, the tough decisions that would get you something that would be you know, far less than six trillion dollars, but like pretty damn impressive all the same. It doesn't seem like there's a, maybe a Karl Rove figure or maybe Axelrod type either who says, I mean, I'm struck when I talk to Democratic political types. Some of them are slightly to the left, some to the center, but they're frustrated either way, because in fact, the reasonable thing probably would be to fight some fights hard for, for the left, if you want to call it the left, you know, and some fights hard from the center, you know, but they seem to all end up kind of with the worst of both worlds. It's been a little too harsh, I think, but where they're sort of not really fighting much enough for either side. And there are probably some issues where it makes sense to be, I'd say police would be one where you really should go aggressively centrist, but other issues you could go aggressively, quote, left, you know, prescription drugs and so forth. There's probably a lot of support for that. And uh, they could make some decent policy arguments uh, on those. And I, I guess I'm, uh, they don't seem to be very good at either. I'll just finish and then let you guys t- explain. At taking advantage of uh, credit for things they've done well. They nominate a very impressive Supreme Court justice, first black woman, obviously. She does very well in the hearings. The Republicans behave, I think, pretty disgracefully. And I think a lot of the country would think so if they knew about it in terms of the attacks on her for being soft on pedophiles and all this stuff. And they don't, it's almost totally forgotten about it. They didn't magnify that at all. They didn't kind of make a big thing of that. Again, it wouldn't be dwarf everything else, but would it get you a week or two instead of a day or two of Oppress Ukraine. I mean, it's just a fact that if Donald Trump were president, he would not have supported Zelensky at the very beginning. And the way 
Biden would, there would not have been a United NATO thing uh, reaction. And who knows what would have happened, but it could well have been a very, very, very different outcome, in my opinion. And but Biden's done a pretty good job by all accounts. But and again, I don't think Biden should go out and give speeches saying I've done a good job. And Jake Sullivan probably shouldn't spend most of his time doing background briefings on it. But it's amazing how little credit he's getting yeah. for managing a pretty complicated foreign policy challenge, I think, pretty well. And now winning votes in Congress on the aid package with large Republican support, despite the failure, the general failures of bipartisanship, that should be a signature. I don't know. Does no one in the White House wake up each morning and say, how do we make this a signature moment? Joe Biden became president. We're helping a democratically governed country resist horrible aggression. And we're doing it with bipartisan support here in the U.S. I mean, that, and we're getting NATO expanded and strengthened. I mean, that should be a, not an impossible message to convey. No, I don't know. It's the great irony of Biden is that the one area in which he was willing to really openly criticize Obama was that Obama didn't do precisely what, what you're talking about, which is claim credit for accomplishments, take victory laps, trumpet what you've gotten done in Washington to get political credit for it with the electorate. And Biden vowed he was not going to make that same mistake. But we saw this in 2021 after they passed both the uh, rescue plan in the spring and then uh, the infrastructure bill uh, in November. You just don't see the sustained electioneering bill based on those accomplishments. Um, Something that we talk about all the time, but that I don't think people fully recognize, you know, in calendar year 21, Joe Biden did not travel west of central time until after Labor Day. And in the entire year, he only went west of central time for a single trip. And the reason he did was was because Gavin Newsom uh, basically summoned him to come out for the recall uh, in September of 2021. If it wasn't for that, I'm not sure that Biden would have made it to the West Coast in the entire first year of his presidency. And then, you know, to take the more present uh, point of view that you just articulated, it's a really good point about the Supreme Court justice which, you know, was not that long ago. And it feels like months and months ago right. now. Um, uh, and certainly the same with trying to sort of navigate um, uh, the, the Russian invasion of Ukraine and sort of this new coalition that's emerged. Um, you just don't see an effort to sort of claim credit for that. Instead, they're reacting to whatever the new challenges on inflation, baby formula, uh, which obviously are serious challenges, but they're much more in a defensive posture on those issues than they ever were on the offensive on any of the other issues. Alex, do you think it it probably just muddles through, continues this way for the next six months, the next couple of years, really? I mean, have we any any reason to think we'll see a big change in the character of the the White House or the administration? A big change? Probably not. Um, because, you know, Joe Biden is Joe Biden for a reason, right? Um, But I think there are two forces that sort of potentially change, um, at at least on the margins, the way uh, they operate. And one is, you know, the midterms are coming, right? And so, you know, nothing can uh, focus the mind like uh, an upcoming uh, electoral shellacking. And then, and if if that is uh, what we're headed for, and, um, you know, if they thought they had a whole lot of time on the clock to sort of like let the Build Back Better debate or the voting rights debate uh, play out organically based on sort of internal dynamics on the Hill, I think that illusion is gone. So if you're going to get anything else before the midterms or anything else before you uh, in all likelihood lose unified control of Congress or semi-unified control of Congress, um, you know, you are going to have to make some decisions and you're going to have to make them pretty soon, right? So, you know, you mentioned prescription drugs. Uh, I think if they end up getting anything that was in the Build Back Better uh, package, you know, I do think that you can you can imagine a scenario. I don't know that it's the likeliest scenario, but I think you can imagine a scenario where in the next couple of months, they say, listen, uh, like Senator Manchin, like, what's the price of admission here uh, for us to get something good on prescription drugs, which we know you like, uh, and something on energy, which is probably going to be uh, not quite as progressive as what we'd hope to get, but like still pretty good in the, the sort of historic uh, scheme of things. I think you could see that happening. Um, the other thing is if uh, control of Congress does flip uh, in November, one or both chambers, I think it changes the posture of the Biden presidency permanently, right? I think it, it the notion that you're going to get things done by running to the left completely vanishes. It's an option that's no longer on the table. Uh, and, you know, 
it's not that working with a, a Republican held Congress would be easy for Joe Biden. It wouldn't be. It'd be uh, likely very, very difficult. Um, but then you have a different political foil in a, a House, what is likely to be a House Republican majority, which is likely to be very, very, very right wing. And at least in its most visible members, very, very Trumpy. And so I do think that gives Biden a certain kind of political footing that he just clearly has not found. So far. Yeah, that could be a Clinton 95 moment, totally. I suppose. Right. Totally. Yeah, they would, they would. Well, can I just add one fast thing here? Uh, Please. It, it, I've never articulated, but as we talk here, it occurs to me that this is totally plausible. And in fact, this may be a sort of crystal like prediction here. Um, uh, uh, false? Is that what of, you're replying? <laughs> the spirit of, of, of Bill Crystal Twitter. Um, I, you know, the infrastructure bill only passed the House last November because it was the Friday night after the Tuesday election. And it, it was that Tuesday, as Alex put it about the midterms, that sort of clarified the mind. Uh, you know, Democrats lost the governorship in, in Virginia. In fact, they'd lost the entire uh, statewide ticket. They lost control of the state house. They nearly lost the governorship in New Jersey, which was stunning and uh, w- uh, unexpected. I kind of wonder if, at the, if there is a midterm debacle bill, if the ECA does not get done in the lame duck session, if you see a kind of urgency among Pelosi, Schumer and Biden and the responsible Republicans in the Senate say, this is obviously never going to get passed in a Kevin McCarthy house. Um, this is important to safeguard democracy. You can see that kind of bill getting passed in November, December after the midterms this year. Yeah, interesting. Let's talk a minute more about the Democrats. This has been such a pleasant half hour, 40 minutes, where we haven't even mentioned Donald Trump. Kind of amazing, actually, for unprecedented for me in the last few years. Um, <laughs> what about around the country? I mean, so let's, I don't we don't know, I suppose. I'm happy if you, if you guys will tell me whether Biden runs and 2024, how much he thinks he should, how much others think he should. Um, but I feel like this partly because there's been so much coverage of Republicans. We all know much more about three candidates running for the Pennsylvania Senate nomination uh, than we do about actual incumbent governors of pretty major states who are Democrats, who, again, in a more normal world would be talking about, well, is this the ne- could this guy be the next Clinton? Is this guy a possible presidential candidate or the same with senators and House members and, and even mayors, I would say. So I don't know. You guys have traveled the country a lot, uh, I think, much more than typical Washington based reporters. And uh, so what what uh, who out there should we be paying attention to uh, sort of half on the assumption Biden may not run in 2024? Uh, and say a word if you want about the 2024 situation, but, but also on the sense of just looking forward for the party as a whole, either on the center or the left of the party, I guess. Yeah, I mean, well, we're we are, uh, I think, as a as a reporting duo, very sort of governor uh, friendly uh, operation here. Uh, yeah. And, uh, you know, we're speaking to you from uh, Gavin Newsom's California. And, you know, I think that it's a sort of remarkable, actually, how little he has talked about as a potential presidential candidate, yeah. given that he is the uh, like very prominent governor of by far the country's largest state, like the financial and in many respects, cultural anchor of the Democratic Party. I think there are a couple people uh, in the uh, sort of category of of, of governors who um, look in a world where Biden doesn't run again. I think that the odds are pretty good that there will be a very strong uh uh, sort of chorus in the Democratic Party to get outside of Washington, uh, that the last couple of years have just been a mess for the party uh, in D.C. Even the people you like in D.C. Uh, are kind of tarnished by, uh, you know, the long slog of it all. The vice president is less popular uh, by by every measure than the president uh, himself. And so who else is out there? Who could we run who's a you know, who's, who, can, who is both uh, you know, a reliable Democrat and also like a change uh, candidate. Right. Um, and that's when I think you start to look uh, at someone like Newsom. I think that you look at a couple other governors who have uh, sort of very delicately tipped their toe in the water. J.B. Pritzker in uh, Illinois, Phil Murphy uh, in New Jersey, Jared Polis in Colorado, all of them are not uh, uh, incidentally very, very a wealthy man who could potentially put a lot of money into making themselves better known nationally. I think Polis is a pretty interesting character. Character. Uh, he has been out there as a voice of you know, when he was in the House, he was seen as this like bolder uh, Colorado left winger. And he has, uh, as governor, uh, sort of reemerged as this like pro-business uh, 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 
you know, relatively centrist and pragmatic character who wants to uh, get back to normal and get rid of these COVID restrictions already, right? I think you can see the appeal of someone like that in theory. Obviously, what all of the, the names I just mentioned have in common uh, is their white men, which is, I think, a, a pretty big uh, liability in some parts of the Democratic Party. Um, and, you know, we'll see who comes out of the midterms. If Stacey Abrams wins that governorship in Georgia, which looks tough right now, but not impossible, I think she'd be an instant uh, presidential contender. If Al Demings won an upset against Rubio, right. also right. tough in Florida. Where no, but that's move? that's another like the 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 midterm cycle, right? As you know it's, as well as anyone, right? Like it generates it's a, in a world totally. where Democrats get like wiped out across the country, but Gretchen Whitmer re- wins re-election by ten points, or like right. they get clobbered in the Senate, but John Fetterman uh, wins it going away in Pennsylvania. Like the cycle creates stars, uh, you know, sort of of its own of its own will. And I think it's such an important point. People have such a static view often and they think of who ran last time, which is important because that often does produce a nominee or it's only a finalist. <laughs> Excuse me. And they think of people who've been governor already for four or eight years, or senator already for six or 10 years. But they don't see how much the the shock of uh, the midterm results could really matter. Sorry, Jonathan. Yeah. No, I was going to say, um, uh, yeah, th- there could be folks that we're not even thinking about right, right now who could be potential uh, candidate for president. I think two points I'd make. One is, I think the clock starts ticking the day after the midterms on Biden totally. making a decision. And I think as we get into the new year, every day that goes by in 23, that the ticking of that clock gets louder. And I think Democrats are going to be really anxious if Biden has not made a decision. And Bill, I think if Trump is looming, it's totally plausible and Biden's numbers haven't improved that somebody could force his hand, you know, maybe a Jared Polis in Colorado or perhaps somebody in the Senate, like a Merkley from Oregon or Bernie Sanders or Elizabeth Warren from, from that left flank um, that's sort of dissatisfied with the direction of the party and wants to sort of uh, push Biden. I, I think that's plausible, especially if Biden has not uh, has not made a move uh, in the spring of 23. The other thing I would mention is just how fast sort of politics kind of moves now. And I think about Biden claiming the nomination and just sort of lightning speed between the South Carolina primary and him effectively wrapping up the nomination. Um, Because of of technology, people are so able to figure the sort of dynamics of these races out. And I just raised that in the context of 2024, Bill, because what you were saying earlier about, you know, how how immediately a governor or Val Demings, in in, in the case of, of what you mentioned, could be an overnight sensation. I think it could move so quickly in 2024. Think about what Obama became starting in the summer of 2004 by the sort of winter of 2007. That was three years. I think now somebody can become a star in far less of a period than that because the sort of the speed of politics has has uh, increased so dramatically. I think they would need, in my own view, I very much agree with this, and I think people are wildly underestimating the chances of people stepping up regardless of what Biden says. I think the notion that they're all going to wait for him, yeah, maybe a little bit, and they'll be told by their cautious advisors they should, but they're going to think for two minutes that, well, wait a second. I, uh, they're going to, so think of Obama, I do think is a good example. People forget how bold it was of Barack yes. Obama and David Axelrod to run against Hillary Clinton in, in yes. February 2007. I mean, that was not considered like, oh, that's a reasonable thing to do. Why not? You know, that was like, what are you doing? You know, uh, you're, you, you can do it in four or eight or 12 years, you know. And that uh, was a sort of juggernaut Hillary Clinton machine totally. whose husband was a sort of two term Democratic president. Still, She was stronger than Biden is as an Incumbent president yes, in some ways, that's right? right. I, I would yes, bet. I would bet, Joe. Right. Yeah. You know, one, one other thing that this is like a, a, a sort of a fanfic, a fanfic scenario, but like also I that's think us, not, you know. Right? Yeah. I mean, like <laughs> not that hard though, man. Yeah. Uh, a world where after the election, if Democrats do get clobbered, right, and like it turns into 2014, like maybe even more than uh, 2010, right? You lose the Senate, you lose uh, everything. I, I don't know that that's where this is headed right now, but you know. If it's a really, really bad night, I do wonder whether somebody in the party who's not necessarily a presidential candidate or aspiring presidential candidate, you know, himself or herself, uh, steps up and says, it's time for the party leadership as a whole uh, to turn over, right? That, uh, you know, in some ways it would be easier, I think, politically, culturally in the Democratic Party, which hates internal conflict so much, 
right? Easier to say, like, it's time for a new generation comprehensively, Speaker of the House, Senate leader, uh, and yes, in the White House, rather than just saying, hey, Joe Biden individually uh, is not working and we got to get rid of it. That's so interesting. That's such a clever idea. I'm going to have to run that by all my 38 year old Democratic friends who were itching to for, if, to have their principles. Uh, the, 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 someone else put it to me. I thought you were going in a slightly different way, which I think is very much consistent with what you just said, though, which is a very good point, Alex, which is someone else said to me, you know, it's hard for the candidate himself to step up. But could a someone else step up and say, we need to have candidates. We need to have an open primary. Yeah. We, Joe Biden's done a great service for this country. Yep. And look, if he runs for re-election and wins, that's great too. But we need to have a real competition here. It's not obvious that he should be the nominee next time. Obviously, I mean, Barack Obama can't really say that presumably Hillary Clinton. You'd have to think of someone who's kind of got the standing to really make a difference by saying that sort of Ted Kennedy vis-a-vis Obama in 2008 would might be a bit of an example, but that was when Obama was already running. Anyway, I do think... This is very interesting, but I, I very much agree that the Democratic nomination is as likely to be as contested as the Republican nomination in 2024. And that's the way I've been thinking about it the last few days. And maybe that's a slight overstatement, but um, wouldn't be surprised if Trump wraps, uh, wraps up the Demo- Republican nomination before anyone wraps up the Democratic nomination. Right. And that would be kind of interesting. Uh, the I mean, how much of the I guess, yeah, there's a question. What does it look like? We haven't really been through this. An incumbent president choosing not to run. What is it? Is how does it affect his actual governance of the party in in 23, 24? We're way ahead of ourselves here, but if that were to happen, I'm not sure which way it cuts. Everyone will conventionally say lame doc, no power, but nah, I could argue that a little bit the other way too, right? You know, sort of liberating and becomes an elder statesman who can sort of do a few things. Yeah, and- I've heard this chatter among Democrats, and speaking of fanfic, I mean, this, this is certainly in that category of at some point this summer, uh, Biden saying, uh, you, you know, a uh, Putin's invasion, the threat of China invading Taiwan, and uh, and and the sort of pressures that we're facing at home uh, with COVID and inflation are such that any president owes his entire attention and agenda to one thing, and that is prosperity at home and and um, and peace abroad. And you sort of use that as your your graceful way out, and and, and sort of sort of just maximize the final. Uh, year and a half of your uh, of your presidency. Look, I think that's very unlikely that uh, Joe Biden's going to lame duck himself in the summer of 22. But when I push back saying just that, the person who was floating the idea, the idea to me said, well, the alternative is that he then gets shellacked in the midterms and he still has to not he, he still is driven from office and he can't run for reelection. But if he does this after the midterms, it looks like he's being driven from office. At least if you do it now, preemptively, you have some cover. You save some face. If you give that speech in January of 23, nobody's going to buy it because you're just going to have lost X number of seats in the House and Senate. You know, interesting. Interesting. I, I in the Bush White House, uh, George H.W. Bush White House, I made this case in mid 91 after we'd won the first Gulf War uh, and Bush had gotten through the. Disabilities Act and the uh, um, uh, sort of affirmative act. I don't know what those words was called anymore, but it was the sort of fixes of, of a civil rights act that were in a centrist liberal direction. And therefore there was going to be a Buchanan challenge. And it was pretty obvious that Bush was going to have a tough time in 92. And it was sort of obvious to me that his heart wasn't in it. And I remember yeah. suggesting to a very senior person, you know, maybe he should just say he's not running and really do a great job governing for the next year. History will reward him, will we'll, 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 we'll praise him. It's really a statesman and so forth. And I, it was all just dismissed. And of course, I think people thought I had ulterior motives as Quest Chief of Staff. But, but, but I, it's very hard to, yes, easy for us to have this conversation, easy for us to have this conversation than for anyone to have it with Joe Biden himself or, or but, but, but who knows? I mean, obviously, Jill, his wife could have it, his sister, there, there are people. Yeah. Um, as much as you should talk about the Republicans for a minute, the title of the book is This Will Not Pass. And what is the this in this? I think I know, but tell, tell us, explain. What is the this that will not pass? And do you believe now as much as when you put the title to rest to bed, what, three, four months ago, probably, that the this will not pass? Yeah, I mean, I think the, the title, uh, we hope, works on a couple levels, but I think the overarching idea is just that this period of uh, political crisis and political uh, division um, is not going away anytime soon. That you know, There was this, uh, I think, wishful thinking through much of uh, the Trump presidency, including uh, by his successor, uh, that all you had to do was beat Trump uh, and inaugurate a new normal administration. 
and the country would sort of find uh find its equilibrium again. The, the fever will break. That's the, the perfect will break. metaphor, right. really. Yeah. Right. Uh, and look, that clearly hasn't happened. Um, you know, sitting here uh, in May, um, which I think closer to nine months after we, or uh, uh, seven months after we finalized the title, um, I think it's clear that this moment hasn't passed. I don't think that it's quite as clear that like it never can um, but I think that it's we're clearly in a place where things are going to get bumpier before uh, they get smoother again. Right. That the Republican Party had a chance to uh, break with Trump. It didn't. Um, it had a chance to punish uh, the really far out uh, extreme forces uh, in its coalition. It embraced them for the for the most part, it embraced them uh, instead. Uh, and Joe Biden had a chance to uh, sort of form a new and durable electoral majority. And he hasn't done that either. Right. So it very much still feels like we are in the middle uh, of getting through uh, this period. Uh, and, and, you know, I think you can see a scenario where you do have sort of major generational turnover in both parties in the next couple of years. And uh, we do find some kind of balance again sometime in the middle of this uh, decade. But middle of this decade feels like a long way off at the moment. Right. Right. No, I think the title, I've always assumed the title only held through 24 and that we we're open to the, we're open to the notion of things beginning to pass in 25, though, even then it's looking less likely than I would have thought a few months ago. But anyway, Jonathan. Yeah, no, I couldn't agree more. <laughs> I feel vindicated every day that goes by about this title. I think the the trench warfare goes on, I think, um, to a mixed metaphor is the sort of partisan silos that people are in um, grow, grow sort of firmer and and more impenetrable. Um, So I, I don't see a much reason for optimism about, about breaking free from this sort of tribalism. And um, I think, especially in the Republican party bill, I think, you know, you just look at the primary uh, uh, electorate and the primary races, you know, re- really starting in the spring of 21. So a year ago, just the dynamic of the primary culture in the Republican Party has been to run toward Trump, to embrace Trumpism, to covet his endorsement. It's a vote of confidence. It's a vote of confidence in Trump personally and a vote of confidence in his style of, of, of politics. And I think um the reason that those candidates are are voting with their feet uh, in that manner is because they're looking at, at polling data that is suggesting that, that they do that. Look, we all on this uh, conversation know the strategists who are running these campaigns. If those strategists got polls back that showed, no, the Republican primary electorate in Ohio or Pennsylvania or Michigan actually wants, um, you know, Christy Todd Whitman kind of Republicanism, you know, I think that those drafts would steer their candidates in that direction, but they're, it's just, they're just bowing to the, the perceived wishes of the electorate. And I think it's the same reason why McCarthy and McConnell rode back to Trump after January 6th. They're just bowing to what they think that their voters want. And so I think that's the bottom line is it's a demand issue that the voters in the Republican party want this style of politics. They like Trump as their leader, perhaps not the nominee, but certainly the sort of face of their party, at least for now. And it's not much more complicated than that. Um, and I think that's in large part why we are where we still are today. Yeah. I think the consultants, I mean, also are weakened by the fact that they spent 2017, 18, 19 saying not unreasonably in a way, uh, you gotta be a little careful with that stuff. That stuff gets pretty toxic and pretty risky, you know, maybe you should just hedge a little bit and stuff and Steve Bannon and other people who, and a bunch of, you know, people who we might think of as, I don't know, whatever they are, but, you know, not the most serious and, and, and the experienced consultants were saying, no, all in, go for it. And at least to listen to those two sets of, just think of her a big shit. This is a good piece by your colleague, Andy Carney, about her today in the times, uh, listen to both sets of consultants decided, okay, you know what? I think Steve Bannon's right. Not, all these reputable types who weren't recommending Christine Todd women, they were recommending like George W. Bush or something. It's the, you know, Dan Quayle is the model. It wasn't that, that liberal, but, um, and, you know, and then you might pay a price for that at least. What price? No price. No price, right? Number three in the House leadership, maybe number one or two if she wants to be next year, maybe a VP possibility, huge celebrity. I think the fact, this is something totally. liberals have a hard time getting their head around and also some of my fellow never Trumpers, so I don't blame them, but, they are no one has paid a price. I mean, I, I mean that almost literally. Like, what political figure has made 
looks back and says, I made a big mistake becoming too Trumpy, too demagogic, too extremist, too much toying with various racial and nativist themes. I guess we could find a case or two where a candidate might have adjusted its head to the center and won where he lost, but mostly it's the opposite, right? And and now maybe 2022 will be a bit of a uh, of a you know a moment of truth for a couple of these Republican Senate candidates. We'll see, but no, I, I think that's very important is, though. That is totally geared toward, uh, yeah, I mean more provocative, more extreme, and uh, and frankly, sort of more, more Trumpism. They, this has not gotten a ton of attention, but I just sort of see it out of the corner of my eye, and it just it tells the whole story. That uh, a backbench member from Florida named Kat Kamek, I think either in her first or second term you know, sort of um, uh, is latching on to the, the baby formula issue with like a really unsubtle uh, attack of the Biden administration is giving free baby formula to illegal immigrants at the border. Here's the picture of the shelves at the Customs and Border Patrol station. And over here, they're not giving baby formula to, you know, us Americans. Uh, it's pretty crude. Um, but you know what? It gets her on Fox. And it gets her lots of retweets. And it's and not even clear that she pays the get. price in a general election, though some of that's a gerrymandering issue. And, so, and maybe some of them will pay a price. But so far, this, again, was where I think the 2022, 2020, excuse me, down ballot results were so important, you know, that they don't really feel like there was some, the, the voters it's didn't say, oh, that's too much, you know, it's even in the general, point. let alone the primaries, you know, it's in these different point. states. So Yeah. And, you know, obviously they lost the House in 2018 in large part because there was a backlash to Trump. But there was never a sort of consideration after that of, you know, maybe this is politically problematic. And then to your point, after 20, they had the opposite reaction of, oh, actually, we did quite well with Trump on top of the ticket. So we don't have to sort of uh, walk away from him, you know. Alex, what do you think about the sort of issue of Trump personally as opposed to Trump is? I mean, how much is it? I've heard intelligent people argue both sides of this. I mean. How much is it Trump specific and Trump dependent uh, going forward? How much stronger is Trumpism with Trump? Could it be stronger without Trump? What, what are people are people talking about that in the right. Republicans you're talking to? Oh, sure. I mean, it's been a running conversation since basically the day uh, Trump um, won the presidency the first time around. Right. I mean, the the, the uh, governor's race in Virginia in 2017 was this question of can you take a basically a totally conventional Republican uh, like Ed Gillespie and have him do sort of Trump style uh, messaging and you get the best of both worlds. You get the folks in the suburbs who don't like Trump. Uh, you get the folks uh, you know, in the rurals who love uh, what Trump is about. It obviously didn't work out uh, in that race at all. Um, I think but it did I, in 2021 in Virginia, they would say. So it's an interesting contrast, right? Sure. Um, uh, you know, as you know, there are also there's also a certain like uh, uh, gravity, you know, just a, a inevitable gravitational force to running in Virginia when uh, uh, depending on who the presidency is, but who has a presidency. But look, I think a couple of years ago, I would have been of the view that Trumpism without Trump is probably stronger uh, than a Trump led party, um, because I do think that uh Uh, resistance to foreign trade, resistance to foreign military intervention, suspicion of and hostility to immigrants. I think those are all really powerful political and social forces. And you don't need this sort of like over the top, you know, uh, campy strongman character uh, to be the spokesman for it. And now I'm actually not so sure, because I do think that the more you see other people try to play those notes, uh, the more it's pretty clear that they sound different when they're coming from the host of The Apprentice than when they're coming from somebody who's just like a pretty conventional, pretty uh, boring and, and frankly, like pretty angry sounding a uh, politician. Right. So I think it's I think particularly when you look at the Republican Party's a performance, you know, it's gains among uh, certainly Hispanic voters and some uh, African-American voters and Asian-American voters uh, in the last election in 20 in a uh, down ballot in 2020. I do wonder th- it, whether that still happens in a world where you have like Ted Cruz doing a Trump impression at the top of the ticket as opposed to uh, the genuine article. And I do think that the broader uh, problem with this whole debate about uh, Trump versus Trumpism uh, is that. You know, Trump kind of decides as he goes what Trumpism even is, right? There's a set of attitudes and a sort of cultural instincts that define, you know, that we have treated as defining Trumpism. But like, is is Dr. Oz Trumpism? I I, I don't know about that, right? Uh, and, and to me, like in a world where Donald Trump decided tomorrow uh, that he was gonna. Um, 
you know, like take up Mahjong and never put his name on, on the ballot again. Uh, I think it's really not clear what the Republican Party even stands for um, when it when it's not sort of organized around this massive, massive gravitational force that is his personality. You know, I think that's so interesting. I'll let you guys find a word here in a second, but uh, it's, it's a bit of a contrarian view. I'd say the conventional view, certainly among the Republican types, the donor class at all, is if only we could have Trumpism without Trump. But I I rather agree with you. The original demagogue, he's a good demagogue and not everyone can be th- pull that off quite as easily. And some of the things that are so ridiculous in a certain way, the real kind of con man, carnival barker side of Trump probably helps him, doesn't hurt him. I've always wondered about that. And But, you know, just look at the empirical data. Florida, DeSantis is supposed to be the most the respectable version, sort of respectable of Trumpism and so capable. And he will get reelected, I assume, the decent margin this year as an incumbent governor. But it, Trump ran ahead of DeSantis. I mean, Trump did better in Florida in 2020 against a much better candidate, you would have thought, for swing voters, Joe Biden, than DeSantis did in 2018 against Gillum, right? So, I mean, all this talk now is a different situation and Trump was incumbent. I mean, this is a very you know, sketchy comparison, I would grant, but th- there's much too much, I agree, dismissal of Trump's actual political skills, if I can hate to use that term, but, you know, for all, because of behind all the goofiness and all this, and I wonder how transferable it is. It's interesting. I, I think. What do you guys um, expect for 2024 on the Republican side? I, I was going to say, I, I think to take Alex's question one step further, I'd be really curious if the, the, the nominee in 24 is not Donald Trump, but let's say it's Nikki Haley or Tim Scott, somebody who is a racial minority, who is the titular leader of the Republican Party. And they carried a message sort of running against the identity politics of the, the modern left. Um, how powerful could that be without the, the kind of Trump race baiting baggage? Um, and like, could they put together an even bigger coalition than what Trump was able to do? Yes, they're more conventional politicians, but they're also pretty powerful messengers. Um, and if they were able to sort of deliver a message uh, sort of um, explicitly targeting the left uh, on identity politics, but, you know, more subtly sort of, you know, targeting their own side for uh, the rights identity politics. Uh, I don't know. I, I think that has the potential to be uh, in a world where Biden or the Democratic nominee is pretty unpopular. That could, I think, potentially be a, a powerful message. But don't you yeah. think DeSantis and Tucker, Car- Tucker Carlson and Trump Jr. are all are much more likely to be the nominee than either Nikki Haley or Tim Scott? That or does don't- throw a slight uh, dig into the whole process there. Really. It's a good, that's a, but it's a good thought, a useful thought experiment. Because maybe that's more the, who knows, the 2028, you know, I'd say resolution yep. of this. But uh, what do you think about 2025 on the Republican side? I mean, Trump runs, yes or no? Others run against him, yes or no? Look, I mean, I think that, uh, uh, you know, Jonathan's scenario, I think, is a really, really interesting one. And and, and sort of, again, in the fanfic uh, uh, department, like, could you imagine a Republican candidate who said, uh, like, listen, uh, we as a country need to uh, not do critical race theory and we need to not do uh, replacement theory either. Right. Like, I find them both. Uh, I'm against theories. Right. Right. No, no, no more, none of these like far out, far out racial theories. Right. Like, I'm not saying that those things are equivalent at all. Obviously, I'm just uh, uh, that's that's sort of. You know, you you could imagine somebody skillfully uh, navigating that. I just don't quite know who it is. Look, I think that the the Trump is going to uh, cast a long shadow over the Republican race until he decides what he's going to do. I do think that there's obviously a window uh, very shortly after the midterm elections for people who are not Trump uh, to jump in, not as an anti-Trump candidate necessarily, but just saying like, listen, we as a party need to get going. And we, you know, I, I have all the respect in the world for uh, Mr. Trump and his uh, accomplishments in office. But like, if he's going to take another eight to 12 months to decide if he even wants to do this, like we got to get cracking. Right. And to me, that's a moment of real peril for Trump himself, right? That if he doesn't actually say he's running and get out there and act like a candidate rather than just sort of doing the elliptical thing he does where he's like, oh, you know, might have some very uh, very interesting news for you about 2024 soon, uh, then it does uh, create the potential for somebody else to get in and really take off, right? And it's the, it's exactly what we were talking about uh, with the Democrats earlier. It could be somebody we're not even thinking about. Uh, it could be a you know backbencher in the House. It could be a cable news personality. Look at what's happened uh, you know, I mean, by the time uh, people uh, uh, 
sort of see this conversation of this kind of may or may not be obsolete, but like, look at what's happened with a Kathy Barnett in Pennsylvania, right? A really obscure uh, sort of more, you know, a fringy activist rocketing past, or at least uh, uh, to, to apparent parody with, you know, the major candidates in the race. I don't think it's impossible to see that happening. What I don't think we've, we have any indication of is that there's a constituency in the party for anti-Trump politics, right? And, you know, I think you, you could very easily imagine somebody- Sorry, Bill. With, a Liz Cheney uh, or okay. an engineer, I like filing the day after the midterms, but it would be a, you know, it'd be a, a quixotic sort of moral crusade more than anything else. Bill, yeah, is no, there a place I, my, for when a you said that, kind of bull moose candidacy, do you think, in 24? I don't know. I mean, when you said that, for, well, that formulation about neither, not again, not that they're quite the same equivalent, of course, but neither uh, white replacement theory nor critical race theory. That's something one could also imagine a certain kind of moderate Democrat saying, I think, right? I mean, you'd have to, it would say it in a slightly different emphasis than the, than the Haley, the Haley or, or Tim Scott, but could also say, look, this white replacement theory is loathsome and has led to murders and is beyond the pale totally. But critical race theory isn't quite what the country's about either. I don't know. Is there a Democrat who can say that and survive yeah, a Democratic no, primary? a really good point. I, I mean, I wonder if sort of Jared Polis is somebody who's, you know, unconventional enough to at least try out a version of that, you know? And you know what sort of the irony in this is like the candidate who actually may be the closest to saying that, like, the candidate who may be in their heart the closest to saying, I don't care about any of that. I don't want to talk about identity at all. I just want to talk about uh, the material uh, economy and the benefits that the government is giving to you is like the farthest left a Democratic candidate in modern times, Bernie Sanders, right? Like in his heart, that's what he wants to talk about. And I do think that there's an opening there. I don't think quite in the formulation that you just described, but like for somebody closer to the political center to say, uh, no, I don't want to just keep on talking to ourselves about labels and definitions and identity groups. Uh, I want to talk about a more uh, sort of comprehensive, integrated uh, and, and concrete uh, view of what the country ought to be. Interesting. Well, look, thank you both so much for, for taking for taking this time. We'll have to get together. And the lesson my takeaway from this is the 2024 race in both parties begins in a very serious way, much more than usual. People say always, oh, it begins the day after the midterm election, but it doesn't really begin. The, you know, a lot of talking begins the day after the midterm election and it's inconclusive for months usually. Right. But this really does begin quickly in November. Yeah. Don't you think? I mean, we, we need to get back together around Christmas and really see what's what you guys are learning about what's happening in both parties. We'd love to do it, Bill. Thanks for having us today. And I, uh, I'm i just sorry that we couldn't get to the Scoop Jackson campaign in 76. What went wrong? But we'll save it for next time. That's going to be a great the great special conversation. Not exactly featured on the website, but maybe for very, <laughs> very few. Uh, the Moynihan absolute Scoop Jackson conversation. Alex Burns, Jonathan Martin, thank you both for joining me today for this very interesting conversation. And thank you for joining us on Conversations.